Few television shows have made my jaw drop like Succession. Anyone else watch that one? Okay. If you didn't, it's okay. I'm not going to spoil anything. Succession was a dark comedy drama that ran on HBO from 2018 to 2023. It was Shakespearean, truly, in its depiction of contemporary wealth and power. For those who didn't watch, or those who haven't watched yet, the show centered on the Roy family. Logan Roy, the patriarch, owns a huge media conglomerate, and three of his children, Kendall, Siobhan, and Roman, are competing for the role of successor. Logan Roy is a tyrant. He is fickle and cruel and pretty good television, constantly pitting his children and staff against one another for his approval. There were several episodes from the series that left a visceral impact. I, I couldn't binge this show because it would literally grip me with anxiety. And one of those episodes was from the second season entitled Hunting. Logan Roy takes his leadership team on a corporate retreat slash hunting trip in Hungary, during which a conflict arises over a potential corporate acquisition. Logan Roy deals with this conflict through a show of his dominance inventing a game he calls Boar on the Floor. Logan goes down the table where everyone is sitting, asking each individual to stand up, be on the spot, and give their honest assessment of the acquisition. If he senses inauthenticity, or weakness, or if he just doesn't like the answer, the individual must play the game. As the viewer, you watch as three grown men are ordered down on their hands and knees and commanded to oink like pigs. Logan then throws a single sausage onto the ground with the rule that whoever eats it first wins. The others in the room look on in disgust, fear, and in a few cases, glee as the men scramble over one another. This episode of television dramatized the depths of corruption that can exist within powerful institutions. Yes, it, it, this is a television show, but the director and the writer of it studied real life events in preparation for filming. People will go to great lengths in order to maintain power or to have access to it. Herod wanted to maintain his power. 
He ruled Galilee as a client state of the Roman Empire. He was the disfavored son of the far more powerful Herod the Great, and he had a bit of a complex about that. And in today's text, he throws himself a birthday party. This story is both a flashback in time and a foreshadowing. A minor passion narrative that presages the passion narrative of Jesus. Mark intentionally places this grotesque tale in his gospel, sandwiching it between the sending of the disciples and the feeding of the 5,000. Its placement is a cue to the reader that God's work is risky and that God's work opposes that of the empire. Herod's party is attended by other rich and powerful men, likely people he wanted to impress. And for the evening's entertainment, he turns to his stepdaughter. She dances for the room, She dances for the room. A dance that is so pleasing, the text says, to the men that Herod decides to grant her whatever she asks. If that made you feel icky, yeah, it should. She isn't sure what to do with this favor that she's been granted, so she turns to her mother for advice who, due to her own grievances, asks for the head of John the Baptist. The request is fulfilled, and the stepdaughter, just a girl, is presented with John's head on a platter. It's no bore on the floor, but it's not good. Here we see leadership governed by greed and lust, fear and guilt, and ultimately the desire for power. I believe that someone said something about this once. Power tends to corrupt, right? And absolute power corrupts absolutely. This is a deeply political text, and one that we shouldn't shy away from in our times. Succession isn't the only contemporary example of corruption, is it? We can see it in our institutions, in courts, in government, in churches. Human institutions have always clung to power in ways that are unjust, violent, and humiliating. And God's work? God's work has always opposed it. God's work has always opposed it through prophets, through everyday disciples, and through possibilities for grace. One way to read this text, and an important way to read this text, is to see Herod as a symbol or as an archetype. To read this text as a reminder of our collective role in opposing the violence of empire. Another way to read this text is to relate ourselves to Herod. Herod attempts to navigate multiple allegiances. He is at once ruler, friend, birthday boy, peer, husband, father, and spiritual seeker. The text says that Herod is perplexed by John the Baptist. He's quite frankly scared of him. I think it's the kind of fear we have when someone tells us a truth that we don't want to hear. When someone holds up a mirror to our actions and forces us to confront ourselves. 
Herod, in this moment, must make a choice. He must decide which allegiances to prioritize. Will it be his allegiance to power? To image? Or will it be an allegiance to this holy tug on his heart? Well, we know how the story ends. He chooses ego and power to disastrous consequences. The consequence, of course, of John the Baptist's execution, but also the consequence for his own soul. This decision, you see, blinds Herod to Jesus. If you go back to the beginning of this story, you see that Herod is completely freaked out by Jesus. He thinks that Jesus is John reincarnate. He cannot comprehend the ministry of Jesus or the very being of Jesus because he is blinded by his previous decisions. He is blinded by his past of violence and coercion. We all have multiple allegiances. We all have multiple roles that ask for our time and attention. Parent, teacher, friend, spouse, sibling, citizen, doctor, homemaker, pastor, disciple. And there are moments when all those allegiances nicely align, but there are also moments when they are in tension or when they outright conflict. You have to go to work, but your kid is sick. You love your partner, but you do not agree with a choice that they are making. You want to maintain friendships, but you feel compelled to speak out for justice. We all have decisions to make, and they all have consequences. They aren't head-on-a-platter level consequences or bore-on-the-floor level consequences, but they are consequences. Your boss gets mad, your relationship ends, you go against your principles, and you have to sit with that. These moments of decision, those are the possibilities for grace. God constantly, every day, gives us the opportunity to choose God's path. Do not underestimate your importance. Don't underestimate it. Your daily choices matter. Your personal involvement matters. My God, your civic engagement matters. And you're going to get it wrong. At least once. So am I. We're going to choose the path of least resistance. We're going to side with the imperial forces of money and power. We're going to choose to be comfortable rather than put our neck out there. We're going to make an intentional or an unintentional mistake that hurts someone we love at least once. The story of John the Baptist's death foreshadows that of Jesus. It foreshadows the inevitable conclusion of Jesus' radical ministry, a ministry that confused and scared and held the mirror up to the violent powers of this world. A ministry that ultimately means we are not defined by our mistakes, but by our status as the beloved ones of God. A ministry that makes it possible for us to be forgiven and to try again. A ministry that is still at work in the world even when it seems that violent power reigns supreme.
We began using our current benediction in 2022. Following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we started using it as a way to connect us as a congregation to our human siblings around the globe to remember that war and violence exists and to connect us to the reality of the times in which we live. It's been over two years, my friends, and I could spend a long time naming acts of violence that have occurred since then including what happened just yesterday. Many of us came into worship this morning with fear about what happened and fear about what it will mean for an already contentious election cycle. There are churches this morning where former President Trump will be praised as a martyr, will be compared to John the Baptist, and lifted up to energize the movement of white Christian nationalism. We cannot pretend that that's not happening. We also can't pretend that Jesus doesn't have something to say about violence. Jesus himself <laughs> was killed by state violence. Jesus says again and again in his text that we are called to be people of justice and peace, but we also must be clear about the width and the depth of violence in our times. What happened yesterday was violence, but it's also violence to call for mass deportations. That's also violence. It's also violence to strip away the bodily autonomy of women and trans people. That's also violence. And it's also violence to promote racist ideologies and to say that we should go back in time to when so many people in this room couldn't vote. That's also violence. I believe that to be followers of Christ in these times to, is to be clear-eyed about the multiple methods of violence that are at work and to prophetically affirm that God is still present. If I can tell you one thing this morning, it's that God is still present because there are also places this morning, maybe churches, maybe homes, where people will say that God isn't present anymore. And that's not the truth, my friends. God's work continues even now. Even in this political reality, even in this war-torn time, God's work continues. And there is no smoke-filled back room. There is no corporate retreat. There is no conspiracy theory. There is no Project 2025. There is no humiliating act that can stop it. God's grace is accessible right here, right now, for each one of us in our decisions. That's the good news. Amen. Amen.